Again, Father, we thank you for your presence with us, your word of truth. Challenge and change us through it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Author Tony Campalo, uh, a, a name you probably haven't heard for it, he wrote in the mid-80s, different things. He tells a story of how he and a friend dreamed of sneaking into the local hardware store at night and going around and changing all the price tags on all the merchandise <laughs> so they could come back in the morning and just watch the confusion that took place. The story is in his book entitled, Who Changed the Price Tags? Though it's written decades ago, it addressed and addressed the changing cultural values of the time. Still has a lot of re re relevance, and it can apply to the anchor text for our series, our short series that we've been in called Defining Value. Our anchor text has been Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Let me just read that with you real quickly. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, Jesus speaking, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. <clears throat> but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then if the light within you is in darkness, how great the darkness. No one can serve two masters. <clears throat> Either he'll hate one and love the other, or he'll devoted, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And as we've been in this, uh, just a short summary uh, review. Basically, we can boil it down to these key things. Put value uh, in things of true value. Second, keep your heart, your loyalty, your focus. Uh, it, they go after what you value. Third, keep your head right regarding what truly has value. And fourth, only, ultimately, only one value will drive your heart, your mind, your decisions, and your actions. <clears throat> so we've spent time in this text. Today we're going to explore two other segments of the Bible that help us understand a little bit more about the principles presented here. You're welcome to turn in your Bibles to the text as we go there. They'll be displayed on the screen behind me as well. The first one is in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and the segment is verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> I'm just going to look at it kind of verse by verse here. The first verse, verse 17 1 John chapter 2, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do not love the world. Love here is a, is a strong term. It indicates loyal devotion. Based on the grammar, in fact, it's directed to people that, that are believers but have already shifted their affections, their devotion, their loyalty to the things of the world. <clears throat> Now note, the author doesn't, uh, as he's inspired by God, does not advise them to abandon the world or live in seclusion. Some people take the wrong impression sometimes out of some text of Scripture. The issue is what they love, where their loyalty, where their worship is. God has provided many grace gifts throughout the world for us. The ability to enjoy the uh, beauty of creation, relaxing a, with a cup of coffee if that's the type of thing you like to do. Even the possessions owned, uh, a puppy's full energy, all things that can be enjoyed. But when they replace the creator, when they become of greater value, when they're elevated to a level above God, we begin serving what is created rather than the creator, and that is where we go off offline. And there are consequences, uh, uh, impacts in our life as a result of that. To love the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do you hear the parallels there between that and Matthew 6, 23 and 24? You can only serve one master. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. You'll love one, you'll despise the other. You can't serve two masters. But the text uh, develops the thought a little bit in giving us some insight in how we're drawn in. And it actually mentions three things. <clears throat> For everything in the world, 
and talking here not just the physical world, everything that's part of the world system, that, that system that is leveraged by Satan to distract our eye, to cloud our eye, to, to uh, change our sense of value. Everything in the world, that world system, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does does not come from the Father, but from the world. Two, the first two sinful desires that typically are hidden and internal. The third a, uh, it, it is an element that's be more visible, more revealed, a sinful behavior that is more obvious to others. All three deal with the truth of Matthew 6, 21 and 22. Heart follows value. And again, we balance that. Heart follows perceived value. What we decide is the greatest value, that is what we will pursue. That is why the eyes need to be clear. So we understand that we, what the true values are of items, and we make good choices. <clears throat> the first, literally the phrase, lust of the flesh, they originate in a person's nature. They are things that give birth to sin and spiritual choices that are opposed to God. The flesh, there are a lot of ways to define that. The scriptures talk about the flesh. It's not talking about just the, the, the blood and the bones and the things uh, that, that we have in the physical appearance. The flesh, as the scripture uses it, is the part of us which is trained to respond to a world system, a world system of pricing that is controlled by Satan. It is a habit pattern within us that is enticed and leveraged by Satan. It is a part of us that needs to be retrained or literally be put to death. It needs to be placed under the control of the Holy Spirit. The second, the lust of the eyes. Now, what entices the eyes, the things that captivate us in the world around us. Eve, as she was in the garden... Ah, oh, that tree looks, the fruit in that tree looks really, really good. David, as he sat in his castle and looked down on Bathsheba, the lust the, uh, of the eyes. Concentrating too much on something can actually increase its value, can momentarily take over your heart. You see that in the world around us in all kinds of stuff. We went to the state fair this year, my wife and I had a chance to go through that, and there's booths that are selling all kinds of stuff. And you know what they have in common? You need to buy it now. Here, look how great it is. Hi, look how desperately you need this. It's to catch the eye. It's to create a need. Much of marketing is to create value and, and a sense of shortages. You better buy it right now. Costco, Sam's Club, the end caps at different stores. They're there to catch the eye, the lust of the eye, to attract it, to develop, in a sense, a magnetic pull. And you know that, uh, that it turns from, you've never had interest in this, and all of a sudden there's curiosity and there's interest, and then what? Got to have it. <laughs> Got to have it. And you know that happens, and you get home, and you, and you go through your bags, and you think, why did I buy this? I don't really need this. Or maybe six months later, you find it in your closet, still in its package. That's kind of what it's talking about with the idea of the lust of the eyes, the magnetic pull, the temptations to buy, to possess, but really temptations that are run deeper than that. They're temptations to draw us away from God and to change our understanding of value. See, true value isn't artificially created. It's not created by impulse. It's not created by salesmanship. And the eye has to be clear to understand that value. So the, 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 the lusts or the desires, the cravings of the flesh, those things that, that are part of, of, the, of the fallen nature within us, the things that catch our eye, that attract our attention, and the third talks about the boasting, the pride of life. That is, uh, if you were to uh, try to get it into a definition, that's a hard phrase and concept to catch into definition. But I think we can boil it down to a reputation or a public image that is the most important thing in our life. 
that whatever is uh, that whatever um, uh, is the status symbol that's important to me has to be reflected in my life. It is that which must I define my identity. You see that in the lives of individuals that they like to brag about what they have and show off what they have. You see it in a false image in some people. Maybe driving a luxury car and not letting anyone know they live in a tar paper shack and eat macaroni and cheese for every meal. It is an image, it is a projection. The pride of life, the boasting, uh, look who I am or look what I have. And because of those things, I have value and importance. That's the third. And all, all three of them are scams. And scams work because of what is in our hearts. This deal that is too good to be true is actually too good to be true. It appeals to the inner heart. I need more than I have. What God provides for me is not enough. It's not good enough. It's not adequate enough. And if you can sink any deeper into the root system, under each of these things, there's a certain amount of pride and independence that was first displayed in the Garden of Eden in the original sin. I will be like God or above God. I will be the master of my own destiny. All the other stuff is just actually showing what's inside the heart. <clears throat> One author uh, uses this summary statement of these three things. Anything in this life and the world that is not God can rob your heart of the love of God. Anything that is not God can draw your heart away from God. If you don't have it, it can fill your heart with passion to get it. If you've got it, it can fill your heart with pride that you have it. Heart follows value. Make sure your eye is clear. What encumbers the eye? It is the cravings of the flesh. It is, it is the lust, the desire of the eye. It is the pride of life. Those are three key factors. Text goes on in verse 17 and simply says this, The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Do you hear Matthew 6, 19 and 20 in that? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures, where? Here on earth. What happens to them? They rot, they rust, thieves break in and steal. Instead, the second command of that, that text, lay up for yourselves treasures, where? Where it doesn't rust, it doesn't rot, and thieves do not break in and steal. It helps us understand how that eye, how the eye is drawn away, what's, what's pushing. And with that, it gives us an ability to understand and stand a little bit more adequate against it. Second text that uh, blends in, that, that complements, uh, that builds on the principles that Jesus gives here in Matthew 6 let me refer you to James, the book of James, chapter 4. <clears throat> it's a text that actually starts with questions. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they not come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight, you do not have because you do not ask God. What causes the fighting? Don't they come from the desires within you? Well, what desires are those? Well, first John's named three of them. Remember them? We just covered them. The cravings of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Those things that are driving and, and motivating us to seek a wrong treasure. Last week, uh, as we were in Matthew chapter 6, we've been focusing on that section, but we, we drift a little bit into the next several verses that are almost a, a summary statement, a conclusion, because they start with the words, therefore. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. 
And then a couple verses later, don't, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Catch this, for the pagans, that is those who are apart from God's people, who are not God's people, the pagans run after these things and your heavenly Father knows you need them. Instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has its own trouble. Make sure you make that connection. You have two options. One is to rest in God and to trust in Him and hold Him as the primary, the only, the treasure, the source of life, the source of fullness. Or you can run after the things that the the people who don't know God run after. And if you move into James chapter 4, let me just paraphrase that real quick. If that's your treasure, and if that's what you need to be happy, you better do everything in your power to get it. Lie, cheat, steal, oppress, do whatever you need, because if that's what's going to bring you happiness, you better get it. And that's what, in essence, is being talked about in James chapter 4. Why are you fighting? Why is this conflict? It's because you think you need this to be full and happy. And it creates that war. But here's the reality. I think most of us understand that from experience. But the text is clear. If you live in the world system, seeking to have your affections and desires filled apart from God... You better fight, you better steal, you better do whatever it takes, but here's the bottom line, it won't work. You see, we started this series, we kind of leveraged off of Aaron as he shared and asked the question, why would a person give up their reputation, their family, for pornography or for an adulterous relationship? Because all of a sudden, that's perceived as what's going to bring happiness. That's perceived as full value. It is, in essence, the addiction cycle. And when you go that route, you need longer hits, you need deeper hits, you need more frequent hits. That is the, that is the functioning of addiction. Addiction, by one author, a very good insight, is a replacement, a substitution for true relationship. It is a substitution for that which God has created us to do, and that is to have relationship and fullness and abundance in Him. It's a substitute for true relationship. It will wear you out, and you will come away empty so desperately want something that satisfies us, and often we to fill that vacuum that only Christ can satisfy, we go other places. And so here in James, what causes the fights, the quarrels, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? As you say, this needs to be in place to be happy. The text goes on. You want something, you don't get it. You kill, you covet but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. And then an interesting thing, did you catch that? Um, You don't have because you don't ask God. But then, kind of an interesting follow-up. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. Let me just put it in this kind of a, 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 dra- a, a dramatic, vivid color type of thing. Imagine one day coming home And your spouse says, I don't appreciate your love anymore. Even though you've been faithful and sacrificially served me, I want you, the spouse says, to immediately get to work to locate a new lover for me. Here are the specs. Here's what I want. Well, I'm not going to finance that. You, 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 You need to pay for everything. You need to go out and find a substitute for me at your own expense. I hope that sounds, and you're to do it without question or reserve. I hope that sounds as sad and as sick and as broken to you as it does to me. That's how the text moves to the next cycle. So here you just think happiness is found apart from God, and then if you finally end up saying, oh, God can, God is a provider, God provide this, this substitute for yourself. You can spend it on your wrong motives. 
And then uh, very abruptly, as, as James, the whole tenor of the book, very direct, you adulterous people. Don't you get it? You can only serve one master, not two. And there's only one that's going to be worth serving, and that is God. And why would you move away from that primary relationship to a cheap substitute? It's a breach of the relationship, even if without a breach of the relationship physically, it's a betrayal of the highest form. We can't even imagine faultless God who is faultless towards us, full of grace and goodness. Even when we experience hardships in life, his desire for us is our best, and through those hardships to prune us, to adapt us to the image of his son, to go after, not only want to go after a substitute, the things of the world, but to ask God to provide it for us. You adulterous people, don't you know friendship? And again, this is, this is not just enjoying what God has given us, but a linkage, a relationship, an adulterous relationship. Don't you know that friendship with the world um, is hatred towards God? What is that? No one can serve him two masters. Either he will love the one or hate the other. Or he'll love one and despise the other and just uh, almost see it as in their way. Anyone that chooses to be a friend of the world becomes a friend of God, uh, an enemy of God. Does that make sense? Does that help uh, full out that, that, that Matthew 6 text? Don't lay up for your treasures here on earth. Lay them up in heaven. Heart follows value. Be really careful what you see as value because you only have one master. One master. One master, you'll love one, you'll despise the other. You'll love one and feel trapped, hindered by the other. And then the text continues. Or do you not re think that the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies in, intensely. He created you, and he created me, that we might, uh, that he might be our supreme love. Be summarized in Matthew 16, 11, you have made me, the psalmist writes, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The jealousy, we see jealousy always as so negative and so wrong because typically the way we display it, it is. But the jealousy of the, of the, of the holy God before us, his created, for us, the ones he has repurchased, a new creation, to whom we've, he's perfectly showered affection and faithfulness, the desire to protect that holy relationship for our good and that we might excel in life to be jealous of that relationship because he is worthy of our love and our passion last week introduced we introduced some practical benefits that come from yielding to the lord uh, to jesus as lord and master and there are a lot of practical benefits but we're not doing it because of what we gain. It is a choice to passionately release ourselves to the one who has created us to love and experience him in fullness. That's the deeper vein. Passionately release ourselves into his provision and ownership, yield to an intimate relationship which is pure, full, and unconditional. It is a choice of value. It is a battle in the flesh. It is a battle for our heart. It is a choice of affection. Peyton, just appreciate you sharing that. I mean, just as you heard Peyton's story, you hear Matthew chapter 6. You hear 1 John chapter 2. You hear James chapter 4. Some of the things from his testimony, the, the challenge. But you also hear in Peyton's story 
the celebration of how love and passion grows, how God invests and seeks to develop that and to bring it forward in us. One thing we've not done in this series is talk, well, how do, you develop, uh, how do you develop a passion for God? And, and there are certainly things we can do. But we need to be very careful because it can easily become just one more work. That's why I think as the text flows here, do you think the scripture without reason that the spirit he caused to live in you uh, envies intensely, but he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Understand this, that just as, as Peyton displayed in his testimony, it's God that reaches out. It's God that moves us closer to himself. We have a responsibility to make choices. We have a ch responsibility to respond. But let's not get so arrogant to think that we can do this in and of ourselves. Then it becomes a works rather than a grace-based thing. He gives more grace. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He's opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. We can't do it by ourselves. It is a gift of God, so we need to humble ourselves. We need to submit to God. Scripture goes on to say, and resist the devil, that is to resist the false scams of the evil one, the myth of the greener grass, the lie that there is more available than what we have in God. It's really the truth of any relationship, isn't it? If you want a, the best possible relationship, at some point you need to decide to, to get rid of the competition. Because if you're constantly looking over your shoulder and wondering, well, maybe somebody's better, you're never going to have stability in your relationship. Why? <laughs> right? How many masters do we serve? Yeah, it really boils down to that. So there is a choice uh, to, to um, submit ourselves, to humble ourselves to God, to resist that lie, to choose to remove competition. Text says, come near to God. That's another relationship 101, isn't it? <laughs> if you don't have companionship, if you don't spend time, you really don't build relationship. And God has given us such a blessing of having his word and access to him through prayer that we might see him, we might spend time in his presence and understand his love, his fullness, his power, his grace, his magnitude. As we lock in on that, as we, as we spend time in his presence, the other stuff will fade away. There's other practical things we can do. Another one is, is just to get counsel. To have somebody in your life to help you keep your head on straight. Does that make sense? Somebody in your life that uh, will help you not fall for the scams and, and get incorrect pricing going on. When Aaron spoke several weeks ago, he introduced a, a ministry that we're, we're beginning here at the church called Conqueror's Series for those that, that struggle with pornography, men that struggle with that. It's available. It's, a people, it's having people around you to remind you what the really true value is and to encourage you to pursue that. But it's not just in that realm. That's why we need the fellowship of the body. That's why we need somebody close enough to us that they can see if we start to move our eye the wrong way and encourage us and build us up in what we have in Christ. To remind us satisfaction comes only through God and God is our supreme love. So that's kind of a challenge as this uh, segment finishes up. It says, wash your hands, purify your heart, remove the double-mindedness. We have such short memories. Again, the text in 1 John is written to people that have shifted their affection. I think James chapter 4 has that element as well. It's writing to believers, and you've got fighting, and you've got stuff going on. What's wrong? What's wrong is the heart has put the value of the wrong place. We have such short memories, and we get so easily distracted. We wash our hands. We purify our hearts. 
we remove that double-mindedness that tries to ride two horses at the same time, that tries to do what, what God's Word clearly tells us we can't do, and what by experience we probably figured out by now, you can only serve one master. Put away the double-mindedness. Lock in on the one who is true. So the challenge for this morning, if you are uh, maybe a bit cool to God, maybe you are like the people in 1 John, maybe you are like the people in James 4, that you've, your eyes have drifted, they're cloudy. It's an invitation this morning as we look at these things to understand how, how we get drifted and the challenge, the invitation to reverse course, to renew God as your heart's desire. Because in there, in that, is the fullness of life. The scriptures say, taste the Lord and see that he is good. Two primary things that I would like to see come out of my ministry. One is that people come and respond to Christ as their Lord and Savior. Second, that they taste and see that he's good. Because that locks in value. It understands, it pulls the passion and the love from the heart. And enables us to truly serve God above all else. If you're here this morning and maybe this is new stuff. You mean God offers this? God offers this freedom that God's the full value? Maybe you haven't responded to that. There's an invitation here. To taste of the Lord and see that he's good. And that starts. That starts with yielding to him. To let him become your heart's uh, uh, desire. And the first step is to respond to the salvation message that you yield your life. You acknowledge, I have sinned, I've gone astray, I've pursued this stuff that is just junk. I repent of that, and I want to pursue the real stuff. And I thank you, God, that you sent your son, who died on the cross, to pay the penalty for that sin, but also to buy me freedom and release to the things that matter, things in your presence and friendship with you. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you're floating. Maybe you're doing well. Maybe your eye is tuned in and it's clear. Just celebrate that. Give God the praise and the glory for the work he has done. But again, if your eyes have drifted, it's time. It's time to re reorient. And if you've never made that decision, the challenge is to do that so that you might be truly free and be able to set aside the stuff that doesn't work for the thing that is the passion that God has created in our very heart. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your love, your faithfulness, your goodness. Thank you for the promise of a path back to you. Thank you that you don't give up on us and that we can come, we can wash our hands, we can cleanse our hearts, and we can set aside the double-minded and pursue you in your fullness. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.